What's up, dude? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. So, as promised from yesterday's video, today we are talking about the Joseph Demer case and the new developments that have come from it. On the evening of March 24th, 1961, Joseph Demer, 53 years old, went out to eat with his wife, Francis, who was 33 years old. We love a good age gap. Joseph was a very well-off businessman living in Miami, Florida with three college-aged sons and a 19-year-old daughter at this time. His first wife had passed away from cancer just a few years earlier. Francis was a widower with four children when she met Joseph and was working as a bank teller at the time. It wasn't a bad job then and it's not a bad job now. Uh, Joseph helped co-found the produce company Demare Fresh and that did very well. So Joseph was a very well-off man and he had a lot to his name. He was kind of living the high life, but like he deserved it because he was a hard worker and made very smart investments. Francis told the police that Joseph and her were driving to dinner at, at Mike Gordon's restaurant around 7.15 p.m. While the couple was driving to the restaurant to have dinner, they were at a traffic light when two armed men hopped into their back seat and pointed a gun at Frances's head and told her to drive to an empty lot. When she did, they demanded that she hand over all of her belongings. She said that they then pistol whipped her until she blacked out. When she finally came to, she found that Joseph had been shot and killed. Frances ran barefoot from the vehicle to a gas station and called the police. Everybody was investigated, says attorney Paul Novak. They looked into whether it was a mafia hit, they looked at Francis, they had a list of suspects, and around and around it went. One weird thing about Francis's story is that she didn't have any cuts or scr scratches on the bottom of her feet from running barefoot, and the responding officers found her shoes neatly placed next to the car, which also was very strange. And during the investigation, police learned that Joseph had changed his will to say that his wife had to be living at his home the time of his death in order to, in, to be an eligible beneficiary. This was because she had been living off and on in Ohio. I don't really know why she was going between the two houses. Maybe she had a little something, something on the side. I'm not totally sure. A week before his death, Joseph went to Boston to speak with his family about his crumbling relationship with his wife. Francis also flew back, back to Florida during this time, presumably after hearing about the will change. It was decided Joe was going to divorce her and sever those ties, says Novak. He flew back from Boston with the intention to start divorce proceedings. What we believe is he told her that day or that night about the divorce. Also, another weird thing about this case. A trail of blood was found that went from the couple's home to the empty lot. There were inconsistencies in her story about the night that her husband was murdered, but ultimately the case went cold for 62 years. Now that brings us to today. Now it's believed that Joseph was killed at home, possibly in the garage, before the two went to dinner and then Frances drove her car into the field. Miami-Dade homicide detective Jonathan Grossman said that on the day of the funeral, her hair was being done at our home, and I stood over her, and I looked her in the face, and there were no injuries whatsoever. Remember, she had been pistol-whipped until she blacked out. After a battle in court, Francis inherited about one-third of Joseph's um, estate. It ended up being roughly $250,000, and that was 62 years ago. So imagine what that's worth now. Jonathan had collaborated with Paul Novak on this case. Police had even found two casings in the back of the car, and those casings were traced to a gun that Joseph had bought for his wife just months before. Richard, Joseph's son, uh, said, sorry, this is, I don't know why I worded it like this. So this is a quote. Richard says to the detectives, hey, listen, I took my father's gun months before, and I shot it into the pool, and I have the casing. Grossman's told People magazine. Over the course of the years, the firearms unit was able to determine that the casings from the car were in fact fired from the same gun that Richard fired into the pool, which was his father's gun. Also, what a weirdo. Why did he shoot into the pool? Maybe he didn't have like a range or something. I guess I shouldn't judge. I knew the next day and I told the police my stepmother mother was the shooter and they just looked at me, says Richard. At the time of the murder, Frances had been treated as a victim and a high up government official started going to her home and telling the police to just leave her alone, that she's been through enough, she doesn't need to be put through anymore. Frances ended up marrying a lawyer who had defended her in the case um, that dealt with the estate and helped her get her money. 
It's hurtful, says Richard, about his stepmother never facing charges. All the evidence was right there. This should never have gone on this long. Francis passed away in 2006. So unfortunately, the family of Joseph never got any justice for his death. There's so many stories like this where something happens to the will and then the spouse like gets mad and just decides to murder their spouse that changed the will. It's so crazy. But in this case, I don't blame Joseph. I don't think he did anything wrong. The relationship was dwindling anyways. So anyways, I'm curious to know what you guys think about this. Leave it in the comments down below. And thank you guys for watching today's video. I will be back tomorrow with another case. Um, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up down below. And don't forget to subscribe. But if not, that's totally fine. I understand. And for those of you that will be back tomorrow, I will see you then with another true crime career story. Bye, guys.